all right since it is a beautiful day let's talk flip-flops some announcements before we get uh with the lecture your quiz 16 is uh, available on gradescope please go ahead and uh, answer that uh, it shouldn't take you more than a few minutes it's due tonight today is tuesday march 23rd uh, homework 8 is due tonight homework 9 has been posted and is due uh, tuesday of next week studio 5 has three tasks and um, i recommend that you uh, you know uh, continue working on it uh, this week as well as next week it's due wednesday of next week uh, but it, the checkoff process is going to be a little bit time consuming uh, so try try to get the tasks done and checked off early don't wait till the last moment uh, studio 6 will be posted tomorrow uh, it's a it's a simple one in comparison it's a simulation based studio uh, shouldn't take you guys uh, too much time all right uh, that's as far as um, announcements are concerned uh, we also have something coming up uh, next week uh, so Friday of next week, uh, that's April 2nd, we have our second midterm exam. Uh, I have started, uh, yes, it's already that time. Um, I've started a section on Piazza where I've uh, started posted, uh, posting some back exams. Uh, so start, uh, you know, uh, getting ready uh, for exam two. Okay, questions or concerns? And let's go all right so in the previous lecture we talked about latches which was you know essentially your basic sequential element we did latches in the last lecture we analyzed it we looked at uh, a d latch we looked at a jk latch we looked at an enabled uh, sr latch as well so basic uh, sequential element an element that allows you to store one bit of information and it also allows you to make a one and make a zero and then store it uh, we looked at uh, sr we looked at data latch and we also looked at a jk latch and we when we are trying to uh, go through certain timing diagrams of a d latch uh, we discussed the fact that latches were going to be level sensitive. Um, meaning we have some control, a little bit loose control over when the output of a latch can change. Right. So we have some control, not very precise, but we do have some control over when the output can change. So I can say some control. Even though it's a little bit flexible, it's a loose control, uh, but we do have some control on when output can change. That was for the latch. Uh, specifically for the D latch, it was when the C input was 1, right? Uh, when the level of the C input or the gate input or the clock input or the enable input was high that's when the output of the uh, latch was able to change when c was zero then it was in the store state it wasn't able to able to change and if you combine uh, those statements you will see that it corresponds to a level sensitive behavior where the output of the latch is responding is sensitive to the level of this clock input high versus low when it is high, you are able to change the output. When it is low, you are not able to change the output. Now, now we also called uh, we also call latches uh, semi-synchronous because of that semi-synchronous because there is some dependence on uh, a clock input, C input, uh, but it is not a very precise one. So it's still synchronous, but it is not completely asynchronous where there is no dependence. Now, coming to the land of flip-flops, flip-flops are going to be edge sensitive as opposed to level sensitive. 
sensitive. And these are going to be in sync with your clock input. So these are synchronous uh, sequential elements. And the flip-flops are going to allow us to have more control, more precise control over when output of a flip-flop can change, when Q can change. And as the name suggests, is going it is going to be triggered based off of a edge of a clock as opposed to a, the level of the clock. So that's kind of what the, the motivation is, right? We want very precise control over when the outputs can change, which is why we are going from a latch to a flip-flop, a semi-synchronous element to a synchronous element. All right. Um, let's uh, refer back to our um, uh, synchronous network, the general idea where you have certain inputs going into a combinational network. The output of the combinational network, uh, some of those outputs are obtained directly from the combinational network and some of these outputs, which we are calling them as Qs, uh, could be your uh, giving us Q plus, right, next state which go into certain storage elements where we have latches or flip-flops or registers or counters. All of those belong to this category storage elements. And because we need feedback to store, those outputs of the storage elements are being fed back to some combinational network. Now, in the, in the previous uh, set of lectures, we saw this to be next state and this was the current state. But this particular input, the clock input, wasn't very explicitly drawn and we didn't talk about that. But now we are going to start talking about a very strong dependence on a clock input. So we need to put it explicitly into the diagram. So a clock is what? Uh, it's a periodic external input, a square wave, for example, which is coming off of a crystal oscillator. It is going to have certain frequency and duty cycle. And the benefit that we have is we can um, change or not change depending on which uh, edge we are triggering, which we, we are using to trigger our flip-flops. We can be sensitive to the positive edge or we can see, be sensitive to the negative edge of a clock. That way we have very tight control over the uh, time at which the output can change. Now we know that for latches, the output could have changed anywhere over here. Now we are saying it can only change as soon as you see the uh, clock going from either low to high or high to low, right? So I hope you see that there is now a, a tighter timing window for that change in the output to be possible. All right, so let's talk about more about clock. It has a few parameters, let's go through them. A clocking event, also called, a, called as the clock tick event, clock tick event, is essentially referring to the change in the level of the clock, either from high to low or from low to high. It's a transition from high to low or low to high on that square wave, on that clock input. And if you notice here, there you have a high to low edge. What can I call my high to low edge as? Uh, can you guys think of some names uh, for high to low edge? Here C is 1, here C is 0, and uh, falling edge. Okay, so Tyler says falling edge. That is absolutely okay. So that's like falling edge of clock. Falling edge. Okay, what else? There is another name, uh, it's it's also called as the negative edge. You will hear me refer to it as a negative edge, uh, a lot more than falling edge, but they are referring to the same high to low transition. And then on the other side, you have, uh, this was C equals zero, and then it at some point it becomes one, so that would be, the rising edge of the clock. 
also called as the positive edge of the clock. Right, so in terms of uh, what I'm going to call them, I'm going to mainly refer to them using their negative edge or positive edge names. So you can see that for latches, it was the level that was dictating when the outputs can change. And now for the flip-flops, the edge is going to dictate when the outputs can change. More about this. Uh, we are going to derive a flip-flop off of a latch soon. So you will see uh, how this edge triggering takes place. More about the clocks. So there is a low level, there is a high level, right? So if I draw a um, timing diagram for the clock input, I have for certain times over which clock is high, then it becomes low and then high again and low again. It's a periodic signal. Then I can say um, the time for which the clock is high is some T sub H, right? That's the time for which the clock is high. That's the X axis. The X axis is time over here. And then the time for which the clock is low is your low time or the off time. And that's being referred here as T sub L. And if you sum up your high time and low time, you get your time period, right? That's one cycle. The time it takes for the clock to complete one cycle is your time period, which is in this case, T sub H plus T sub L. They don't need to be the same, right? The T sub H and T sub L, because by changing them, you can change the average time for which it is on, thereby controlling the duty cycle of the of this clock. So a few parameters, time period, well, that's just simply time taken to complete one cycle, T sub period, right? So that's your T sub period here, some of those two times. Frequency of your clock is going to be one over time period in Hertz. You guys know that. Then the duty cycle is essentially the percentage of the time for which your clock is high. Usually expressed as a percentage. So it would be T high divided by the total time period multiplied by 100%. That's your duty cycle. Um, so any guesses? What, what is the duty cycle of this clock? clock signal the way it is shown just guess some number let us see if 75 percent okay so that's 66 percent yeah those two number two thirds all right that looks very reasonable estimates right uh but really what i was looking for is a number that was greater than 50 and um not very close to 100 so 75 66 all of that is good right so it's spending majority of the time in the high state uh, but also some time uh, fewer time in the low state so two-thirds uh, 66 percent 75 percent all reasonable estimates that's good now if you flip the clock signal meaning an active low clock then your time period now is going to be t low plus t high the amount of time it spends in the low state versus the high state uh, that's your low time and then the high time. Some of those two is still your time period, but now your duty cycle is going to be slightly different. Now it is going to be the percentage of the time for which it is low, right? Um, and the way it looks like it is very close to 50% in this case, uh, right? But maybe just over 50%. Now, as the clock transitions, uh, 40, 40 ish, 40, I don't know, 40, it doesn't look like a 40 to me. All right, this still looks bigger, right, than this. <laughs> All right, so it's still low. Um, right, so let's go back and look at where that state change occurs. So we are saying, let us not be sensitive to the high level or the low level. Let us try to be sensitive to the edge, low to high or high to low. So the state change or the flip-flop 
occurs as the clock is going from low to high versus high to low right those are the times when it is changing the state all right let's move on and talk about two timing parameters that we have seen a few times already in the course which is the setup time and the hold time now you have two you have two things now uh, because when you say setup time and hold time these are one event with respect to another signal so the signal that we are the the two things that we are looking at are input and some clock going from low to high so the setup time would be the time for which i have to hold my input signal stable before the clocking event takes place so that would be setup time you need to allow certain time as setting up time that would be before the clock changes state and then hold time is going to be the time minimum time again minimum time for which you would want to hold the input signal stable no change after the clocking event so the clocking event is happening over here and you are holding the uh, input stable for some time before and for some time after those are your setup and hold times this would be hold time here and this would be setup time in green but you do have to hold them for a very short duration of time stable in order to avoid the situation of meta stability and we saw you know what happens because of that uh, in an earlier lecture all right so let's try to uh, see how we ended up with flip-flops what all have we done in the previous lecture so when we started looking at latches after talking about uh, a bistable element in terms of two cross-coupled not gates we went to two cross-coupled nor version of the sr latch then we said all right we need a, a different signal the enable or the c or the gated uh, uh, SR latch is what we looked at next. So we uh, increased our uh, option to store by including that enable signal. We had one more option to store the way we store uh, the bit. Then we looked at the NAND version of the enabled SR latch. Then we said, all right, now we can avoid the not allowed state by tying both the inputs together with a NOT gate in the middle. That was uh, the enabled or the clocked or the gated D latch and then the last one we looked at was the JK latch so all of them latches all of them level sensitive all of them semi-synchronous now the question is how do I take these uh, semi-synchronous level sensitive devices and make something that is edge triggered right that responds to the edge and the answer to that is by connecting it in a cascade one after the other master slave configuration so we are achieving edge triggering by connecting two d latches one after the other and we are calling the first guy the master and the other one the slave and it is the famous master slave configuration which is what we have over here uh, in other words, the D input of the flip-flop goes directly to the first D latch. Both these are D latches, right? So let me let me write here. This is latch one. This is latch two. Both of them are D latches. But if you connect the first latch into the input of the second latch, then my claim is that you achieve edge triggering. Both of them are latches. One after the other makes it a edge triggered configuration. Edge triggered D flip flop. That's my claim. But I also, if I, if I want this to work, I also will need the clock state to be different at the C inputs of each of these latches. So if this guy is a one that has to be a zero or if this is a zero that has to be a one i also have to uh, 
uh, make sure that happens by using NOT gates appropriately. All right, so let us try to, and my, my you know, the claim here is if you connect these two D latches in the master slave configuration, you would be able to achieve edge triggering, which is represented by the symbol and characteristic table of the D flip flop over here. We will come back to this. Now, before I actually get into the um, timing diagrams, uh, would the propagation delay from the not gates be an issue with the clock? Uh, so you are you are going to assume that in terms of setup and hold times, you are obeying all the rules, which means QM and the clock input over here uh, is is following the setup and hold time, right? So if it is not, then we have a we have a problem. So you cannot be changing QM too too fast in comparison with the clock. Now, before I actually go into the the timing diagrams over here, let me try to uh, you know analyze the master slave configuration uh, in a little bit more detail. So what I'll do is I will talk about a master slave D flip flop. So this is the same uh, uh, block diagram from the slide before. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to a characteristic table of the D latch because there are two D latches involved over here. So it's a uh, good practice to kind of reflect back to the property of D latch. Then we will talk about the first D latch. Then we will talk about the second D latch. And then we'll try to see how connecting it one after the other actually makes edge triggering work. That's the goal, right? So let's tr start with the characteristic table of the D latch. This was derived in the previous class where you have two inputs. This is your D and this is your clock input or the enable input or the gate input. And because it's a latch, we know that this is level sensitive. So here you see levels of the clock. C is low and C is high. And we said in the previous lecture that when C is high, that is the only time your output of the flip-flop can change. In fact, we said the output is going to follow the input D when the clock is 1. And you can see that play out right here. When the clock is 1, let me highlight that with blue here. The clock is high. When that is the case, the D input whatever you have here will show up after the propagation delay of the D latch at the output. So Q plus will follow D input. But that only happens when C is 1 because it's level sensitive. So I can write these two statements here. Q plus the next state of my D latch will follow the input D, whatever you connect to the input D. But this happens when C is 1. So Q plus follows D when C is 1. But when C is 0, no matter what the D input is, your Q plus will be the same as your previous Q. So the next state output will be the same as your current state output. It's going to be in the stored state. That's when C is 0. So when C is 0, Q plus equals Q. Again, this is something that we derived in the previous class. Uh, but that that's kind of what your uh, analysis is, at least a couple of statements regarding how a D latch is supposed to work based off of the level of the clock, level of C input. Now, if I apply that same characteristic table for the first D latch over here, right? So for this guy, let me let me use maybe blue here right so this particular latch i am calling my first d latch i have an input d i have an output q master q 
Qm, some intermediate output. And my C input actually is clock complement. Right? So, can I say Qm will follow D when C is 1? Right? I need C to be 1 here. If C is 1 here, then Qm will follow D. Can I say that? Absolutely. Now, if I can say Qm follows D when C is 1, in order to get a 1 over here, I need a 0 over there. Right? Which means, I can say Qm follows the D input when clock this guy is zero. Now we are done with the first D latch. Next, my second D latch, let me let me highlight in green. For the second D latch, I'm gonna apply the same criteria here where now Q your final output of the flip flop will follow Qm when there is a 1 here, right? If you want a 1 there, you need a 0 there. If you need a 0 there, you need a 1 there, right? So, Q will follow Qm when C is 1. So, that means you need a C as 1 here. If you need a C of 1 there, you need a C of 0 there. And you need a 1 there. So, C is 1 means clock is 1. So, you see what is happening. You are latching on different levels of C. First, D latch is based on low level of the clock. The second one is latching when, when uh, sorry, the second one, the output is able to change when uh, clock is one. So you, you combine these two together, what can you say? Well, you can say these two statements. You plus follows D when C is 1, Q plus is stored when C is 0, and you have applied these two things to both the latches, and if you did, the first guy, the output of the first latch is able to change when clock is 0, the output of the second guy is able to change when clock is 1. For the entire configuration, it would be, the output of the entire configuration would be able to change when the clock goes from 0 to a 1, right? The, the first guy responds to 0 level, the second guy responds to high level. So the overall configuration responds to when you go from low to high. So I'm going to call this master-slave D flip-flop configuration a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. You see, because it's, resp it's, it's changing, the output is changing when the clock input is going from 0 to 1. The positive edge, the rising edge. So what we did is we have essentially taken two D latches and we have connected them in a master-slave configuration to achieve positive edge triggered D flip-flop. That's what we got. Now, can I ask you a quick, quick question? What should I do if I wanted, what can I quickly do to this to get a negative edge trigger D flip-flop? Remove the first inverter, right? So if I remove this one, one inverter, I'm done. I, I've got a, a negative edge trigger D flip-flop because the first guy, the output can change when C is 1. The second guy, output can change when C is 0. So the overall thing responds to when the clock goes from high to low. You guys see that? So that would be a negative edge triggered D flip-flop. All right. Uh, questions about the master-slave configuration. Outputs of the first latch driving and functioning as inputs to the next one.
all right if you guys don't have any questions let me ask you one um how many nand gates does this guy have how many nand gates does this have how many nand gates does this have does uh the above does above diagram have Uh, you can include include not gates so you also have to synthesize um, not using two input NAND gates do we include inverters yeah, yeah yeah that's what I said right include you have to in, include not gates in your count uh, knife says six Peter says six uh, are you guys sure I think we are uh, underestimating it by a lot let's see guys this is a D latch one D latch all right 12 so one D latch has five NAND gates right because I'm including even this guy if one guy has five, uh, let's see, if I go here, five here, five here, right? That's already 10. And then you've got two of them. I think you're just guessing the random numbers now. Uh, that's not going to work. So it's 12. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, by just doing a simple count of NAND gates, you actually can appreciate what all is going on here and here and the entire diagram for it to kind of work as a flip-flop what is it going to take it's going to take 12 to input NAND gates right so the answer is 12 here all right uh, let's see now we can uh, we can do this now right? uh, do you see a difference between the latch symbol and the flip-flop symbol this is the symbol of the flip-flop this is a d data flip-flop you see a difference in the symbols there is a triangle that's right there is a triangle the triangle is what will tell tell you that it is a edge triggered component Without the triangle, uh, you would have to assume that it is a latch. And just a triangle without a bubble is going to tell you that it is a positive edge triggered. This is positive or rising edge triggered. The triangle tells you positive edge triggered. It's a D flip-flop. So it's a positive edge trigger D flip-flop. Now the question is, how would the symbol of a negative edge trigger D flip-flop look like? Well, you just put a bubble in front. And that would correspond to a negative edge trigger D flip-flop. That's right. But I'm not going to uh, continue to leave that bubble there because of maybe confusion in the future. So I'm going to remove that. Alright, so that's your symbol. Now let's talk about the behavior in terms of the characteristic table. This is your uh, characteristic table. Characteristic table of uh, D flip-flop and positive edge trigger D flip-flop, right? When can the outputs change? The outputs can change only when the clock is going from low to high. It is positive edge trigger. So, Q can go to 0 if you have D as 0 and the clock goes from low to high. And consequently, if Q goes to 0, Q N, the, act, the, the complemented form goes to 1. And if at, at the time clock goes from low to 1, if the D input is 1, then clock becomes 1. So, Q plus equals D 
when clock goes from low to high. You guys see that? Now, when the clock is zero level or one level or actually we can do the other one as well, right? Or uh, when it is going from high to low, no matter what the D input is, the output is not allowed to change. Q plus equals last Q. Only when your input is, uh, you know, when your clock is going from low to high, output can change. All right. Uh, once we kind of understand that characteristic table, let us apply that to the timing diagram at the end. So again, these are two latches, master and slave, connect one after the other. Uh, now let's try to take a look at the first latch, right? So for the first latch, what are the inputs and outputs? You have uh, D, you have clock, and you have uh, QM, right? Only three guys for the first one. Uh, this gives off some Diffie Q energy. <laughs> All right, let's see. D right here, clock right here, QM right here. So we are when when we are going through the first D latch, we are only looking at the first three timing diagrams here. So only with respect to the first latch can you guys tell me when can the output qm change when can qm change and i want you to kind of use clock here when clock is zero right this has to be one and that means this has to be a zero when it is absolutely right this clock needs to be zero level and at all those times qm will follow d all right so let's highlight those times and i will use uh green for that uh, clock low 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 and more of it right? so for all those times highlighted in green qm will follow d and as you can see E is going from low to high, QM is going from low to high a little bit after, right? Like there's a propagation delay. And during that, the, the, the second green timing window, there is uh, D is low, high, then low, right? So QM is also doing low, high, then low. Exactly the same. In the third timing window, you have D going from high to low. QM should hence go from high to low. It's a data flip-flop. Whatever goes in comes out. Next, in the third uh, or actually the fourth timing window, you have D going from low to high. QM goes from low to high. For all the other times, when clock signal, CLK signal is high, there is no change. No change in QM. You see, no change, no change, no change, no change. It sto stays in the stored state. All right, questions about the, the kind of the first uh, three signals, D, clock and QM. Now we can simply expand this to the second latch. For the second latch, what do I need? Well, I need to look at QM, I need to look at clock, and I need to look at the uh, final Q, right? So that would be uh, QM, this guy, uh, clock, this guy, and Q, right? Those are the three things for the second D latch. So for the second D latch, when can Q change? When can Q change with respect to the clock? Right? 
when clock is one that's right so let's try to uh, look at so when are those times those are all the pink times right so that's kind of here here all those are the times when clock is one okay so at those times q should follow q should follow qm all right so let's do that q should follow qn uh so let me use maybe pink for that qm during that window is high so if you started if you assumed that q is zero first right this is an assumption uh we would have q following qm there then there then there then there Q is simply following QM for those pink uh, timing uh, windows on the clock. Those are for clock is one. Now this is your Q, final Q, and that is your complemented form QN sketched. Now what you do is you kind of zoom out of everything and say when you try to answer when is final q changing when is it changing all right so it is changing here is changing here is changing here and it's changing here right so let me mark those points as yellow maybe so here and here and here and here right those are the only four times q changes every the other time q is the same right changes 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 and changes what are those times with respect to the clock low to high low to high low to high but we didn't have any change low to high low to high when is final q changing it is allowed to change only when clock is going from low to high. You can see that? Hence, positive edge trigger D flip flop. Alright, questions about this. How do you take latches, connect them in a master slave configuration and achieve edge triggering? clock just works like an alternating enable then that's right it is first catching a uh, 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 first catching the input based on the low level of the clock then it is relaying that information when the clock goes to one for the second level allison says can it only store data for one clock cycle then uh, that's right it can only change uh, once per clock cycle that's right after that, it has to stay the same. Uh, okay, then clock just works. That's right. Matt says, wait, why doesn't it change in the middle? Uh, because we, we did not take advantage, right? Like we, we, we could have changed here, right? QM didn't change. That's why it followed QM. That's right. So this guy didn't change because this guy didn't change. And this guy didn't change because this guy didn't change. Uh, sorry. This guy didn't change because this guy didn't change and this guy didn't change because this guy didn't change. Right. But it only applies for that, like it could have changed. So I'm, I'm also going to draw this then, um, there. It could have changed even there, but it just so, so happens that D was not changing at that time. All right, uh, let's see. QM is still zero. So for what if you want to give it a value and have it store it for more than one clock cycle? Uh, so if you want to give it a value and not have it change, uh, you can use a feedback. You can feed it back into the D flip flop.
no problem and we'll see examples of you know what all we can do with this so some, something like back or you could do this uh all right let's see we've answered questions here we talked about this we talked about that all right now let's talk about timing parameters now this is going to be repetitive so i'm going to go a little bit faster here uh, because you have seen the setup and hold time windows uh, a few times already so the first timing parameters for a flip flop is the propagation delay from the clock right after there is a transition in the clock how long does it take for the output queue to change but that would obviously be based on the d input right um when you look at this particular uh, timing diagram, what would you qualify this uh, D flip flop as? Positive edge triggered, negative edge triggered? There are only two options positive edge triggered, D flip flop, or negative edge triggered, D flip flop. What do you think this one is going to be? Positive edge triggered, right? So, positive edge of the clock. There is a change in Q. Positive edge of the clock, there is a change in Q. Positive edge of the clock, there is a change in Q, right? Other times, no change in Q. It's going to be the same. So, um, let's take a look at propagation delay, right? When you change a clock, the input D will take some time to affect change at the output Q. And that is going to be referred to as the propagation delay from Q being going from low to high because of a change in C clock. That's your propagation delay. And then similarly, you have a propagation delay when Q goes from high to low because of a change in C or clock. That's this guy right here. Now there are two more timing parameters here, setup and hold time. One is before the change in clock. The other is after the change in clock, right? So setup time is what? Minimum time uh, before clock changes uh, for for your D input to be stable. And similarly, hold time is uh, after there is a change in clock for how long minimum time for how long do I have to hold my D input stable? That's your hold time. And those setup and hold times are kind of indicated by these time zones, right? The, so that's the kind of time your clock is changing. So there is something grayed out before and something grayed out after for setup versus hold. So you cannot change D here. You cannot change D here. You cannot change D here. Oops, you changed D here. So what kind of timing parameter did you break here? What did we break? of time that's right so clock changed here but we changed d before right so we broke the setup time setup time requirement and see what happens because of that your q now goes to the meta stability state because of that bouncing from those oscillations zeros to one zero one zero one zero one but there is a way to come out of it you have to follow a rule to come out of it. You see that? So if you make a bad choice and you have meta stability, there is a way to come out of it by making by some repentance, right? So you, you, you fix your your you follow the rule. Uh, and when you satisfy the setup time next, you will come out of that meta stability uh, state that is shown over here. The so propagation delay setup time hold time questions about these three parameters. What is that? Okay. Now, if you can have a positive edge trigger D flip flop, then you can always obviously have a negative edge trigger D flip flop that we that that we were talking about, right? Removing one of the NOT gates in the master slave configuration will give you that negative edge triggered D flip flop. 
but how do you um, actually uh, show that? How do you uh, uh, capture that native shirt in a uh, symbol? Let me give me one second here. Okay. All right. So how do you capture that in a symbol? Well, this is your D input. This is your Q. This is your complement form of the Q. There is that triangle indicating that it is edge triggered, but now there is a bubble in front indicating that it's a negative edge triggered D flip flop. Negative edge triggered. And we can, you know, do the same thing. Have the two uh, master slave D latches connected back to back, but remove one of the uh, knots, right? So if you remove this guy, you have a, a negative edge triggered D flip flop. Now, you can also have a clock enabled D flip flop. So I, I want to spend some time talking about this here, right? So if you look at things overall, what do you have inputs as inputs? You have a D, you have an enable, you have the clock, you have the Q, you have the QN. Now, let me ask you, what is this clock signal coming from? Where is Where do you think in terms of hardware, where do you think it is coming from? Okay, crystal oscillator gives you a, a periodic square wave, right? So that's that's clearly an option. Um, and I suppose if you guys look at your basis three boards, uh, wave generators, right? So sure, wave generator will give you a square wave. Uh, but if it is integrated on a printed circuit board, then you are most likely using a crystal oscillator to give you that square wave, right? So the next question is, what if I wanted to selectively turn my clock off and on? What would I do? Would it be reasonable for me to pull the crystal oscillator out of my printed circuit board whenever I don't need it and then put it back in when I need it to oscillate. Run it through a AND gate. Okay, so that's run it through some logic, right? But with that logic, what you are really doing is enabling the clock versus disabling the clock. And that's exactly what a clock enabled configuration means you are selectively disabling versus enabling your clocking uh, events. That's the goal here. Now, how are we accomplishing that? We wanted to do a D flip flop. Let's say we wanted to do a positive edge trigger D flip flop. We already have that over here, right? This is your positive edge trigger D flip flop, right? This is your D flip flop. There is, there is the triangle. So it, I know it's there is edge triggering going on. So we already have this and it looks like we put some combinational logic in front of it. Uh, and we are calling this configuration clock enabled D flip flop. So what I'll do is I will go step by step and try to look at logic expressions at this point. Uh, and this point and this point. So what about the first one? What is going to be your logic expression for, for this guy right here? D and enable. Perfect. What about this guy? Second one. So Q comes back right uh, and is going into that so you have q and enable complement and what about here the, the last 
over here. This is just R, right? So I don't need to uh, worry about that. Because I just write it. D and enable or enable complement and Q. If I asked you guys to synthesize this particular logic expression using a mux, a multiplexer, a two is to one multiplexer, do you think you will be able to do that? Let's do it here. A two is to one mux. With enable as select, that's exactly right. You see, enable complement, enable works very well, right? Enable as comp uh, select. So I'm going to put my enable as my select. My output is going where? My output of the flip flop is actually going into the D, uh, D input. Uh, exclusive R gate. Uh, no. the, the, the one input is D, the other input is Q, right? So when enable is zero, what should go through? When enable is zero, Q should go through, that's right. So if enable is zero, Q should go through. When enable is one, should go through and the output is uh, you know we are also calling it d but in reality it is actually the uh, it is connected to the d flip-flop right this is connected to the flip-flop right here so it's like saying q was what your previous output P is what? Your new input. So when you disable your uh, disable your flip-flop, then you are taking the previous output and feeding it back into the D flip-flop. So even if your clock is running, and having more positive edges, because you are taking the queue and feeding it back in, nothing is going to change, right? So it's like effectively you have disabled your clock. You guys see that? But when you enable the clock, then you are allowing the new input D to show up at the input of the D flip-flop, and now you will be able to change Q, but that would happen after the positive edge of the clock. So you guys see that this 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 diagram here. Let me um, and what I really want to do is box this up. So that I can point to this. That's a two is to one max. All right, questions about this. How we have uh, literally taken an enable input to effectively enable and disable a clock without actually having to remove the clock from the design. And you can, you can uh, draw a new symbol for this, which has D input, enable input, this is your clock enable, and then the actual clock uh, signal here, which is the positive edge triggered uh, D flip-flop, and then outputs Q and QN. All of this can also be captured in the characteristic table. When your enable signal is one, 
which means that you have enabled the clock, your Q can change to whatever D is. Uh, why couldn't, so Bennett asks a question, why couldn't a clock enable just be clock ended with enable? If enable is one, it's a positive edge uh, trigger like normal. If enable is zero, Q plus equals Q. But how are you man managing that Q plus equals Q? Right, so that's fine. You know, one, uh, let's feed them through an AND gate. Uh, if enable is one, it's a positive edge trigger like normal. If enable is zero, how are you getting Q plus equals Q? You would need some feedback, right? Clock equals uh, clock and enable. Just stop the edges from happening. All right, so yeah, that that other designs could work, right? I'm just saying that this guy using a two is two on marks can work uh, as a, a as an effective as effectively as as those, where in one you are bringing in the new input and the other you are feeding it back in, right? So you are allowing one of those to go through. Because the, the goal is for this new thing to come and show up at the input of the D flip flop. All right, so let me let me go through this characteristic table here. When enable is one, it would function as your D flip flop. D is zero, Q is zero. D is one, Q is one. So Q will follow D when enable is one at the moment clock is going from low to high because it's a positive edge triggered uh, D flip flop. But if the enable is zero and you are seeing positive edges, negative edges, zero, one, whatever on the clock, if enable is zero, no matter what you, the changes are on D, your outputs will not change, effectively disabling the clock without having to actually uh, avoid positive uh, edge transitions and for the last two cases we are saying what would happen if clock is zero what would happen if clock is one or what would happen if there is a negative edge of the clock then no matter what enable is no matter what d is your outputs will be in the stored state Uh, let's move on here to JK flip-flops. How are we going to make this? Well, one idea could be take one JK latch and put it in a master config, a master slave configuration with another JK latch. That is one way of doing it. One way of achieving edge triggered JK flip-flops. But there are other very interesting ways to achieve JK flip-flop. One common way to do it is to use a data flip-flop to design a JK flip-flop. As you can see, we have a D positive edge trigger D flip-flop here and we have designed a positive edge triggered JK flip-flop by using a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. So the, 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 this is essentially answer to the question how to design a JK flip-flop using a D flip-flop, using a data flip-flop. What does a JK flip-flop have? Well, let's try to take a look at the last four of them, right? Last four you have something going on here, there, color, color, oh, and perhaps pink. Exactly as the JK latch, your JK flip-flop has four different states. 
So what should I call this uh, green state? The top one. Store. All right. Store or hold or memory. How about the blue one? Kill or reset. When is it resetting the output queue? When is it resetting the output queue? The flip-flop. It's a positive edge triggered flip-flop. When K is 1 and rising edge. That's right. So A has to be 1, J has to be 0 and you have to have a positive edge, trig, uh, positive edge on the clock. Only then your output is reset or killed. Right? So the clock also plays a role. Alright, let's go to the next one. What is the yellow state called? Dump. Or set. What about the last one? Toggle. Or flip. Usually toggle. Whatever it was, flips. Alright, so those are your four states and I want to achieve that. Uh, and by the way, if clock is 0 or 1 or negative edge triggered, let me... 1 or 0 or... Um, what did I do? negative edge triggered, then your outputs will always be in the stored state because it's a flip up. It's only triggered by the positive edge. And the symbol for the JK latch, right here, JK positive edge QQ complement. Now let's come back to this. How did we draw this, right? Where did this come from? How did we design a JK flip flop using a D flip flop? That's the question. And to answer that, we need to start talking about a new type of table. Not a truth table, not a characteristic table. In fact, it is the opposite of the characteristic table. It is the excitation table. And the definition of an excitation table is, what should the inputs be? What should the excitation be to achieve a particular transition at the output of a flip-flop? If you want a certain transition at the output of the flip-flop, what should you provide at the input? That's your excitation table. So let's spend some time deriving a excitation table and we'll do that for a JK flip-flop. So let's say, uh, add a page after current template, sure, uh, derive. Excitation table. of JK flip-flop. I'm interested in finding out what should my inputs be based on the output, right? Sort of the opposite of this, right? This is a characteristic table. Here, you are given certain input conditions and you're trying to find out what happens to the output. Excitation table is, I will tell you what I want at the output. You have to tell me what I should provide as the excitation, as the input. So my, 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 my table will flip. Now it's going to look something like this. Your inputs are actually going to be Q and Q plus. Or last Q and Q. Whatever you want to call it. Q, Q plus. That's the transition. Old to new. And if you want that transition, what should you give at J and what you should give at K? That's your excitation table. So obviously, the, there can be four combinations, right? There can be four combinations for the transition. Old might be zero. New might be zero. Old might be zero. Changes to one. 1 to a 0, 1 to a 1. 
So you, can you guys, uh, now that you know at least the characteristics of a JK flip-flop, can you guys tell me for the first condition here, if you wanted your old is zero and your new is zero, what should you give at J and K? All right, so Bennett says, uh, let us try to store them, right? So Bennett says, store state or hold state will work. Will any other or k equals one? That's right. Or the kill state will work. Now, next one. My old one is zero. My new one is one. Kill? No, it's not. It's not going to be kill. Okay, jump. All right. So jump will work. What else? Toggle will work. There you go. All right. For the next one. Third one. Previous was one. New should be zero. All right. Kill will work. Toggle will work. For the last one. Old one, new one. Uh, let's let's do s jump 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 or store you guys okay with this uh, setup here with this table here the way we have filled up so far kind of crucial step so far this one now let us try to take a look at what does this store uh, so let's try to take a look at store and kill. What are those going to be? Store and kill. Jump equals set. Kill equals reset. That's right. So if I want to store, what should be J and what should be K? And if I want to kill, what should I be J and what should be K? Zero, 0 and zero, 01 right so what did 0x that's right so if you combine these two it looks like j has to be a zero but you really don't care about k 0x that's for the first one similarly what would be for the second one j equals what k equals what jump and toggle jump means one zero toggle means one one so, so it should be one x that's right next kill and toggle kill means uh, 0, 1, um, toggle means 1, 1, J should be X and K should be 1, perfect. What about the last one, jump and store? Uh, I think jump is what, 1, 0, store is what, 0, 0, X, 0, that's right. That's going to be your excitation table for a JK flip-flop. Let me just uh, wrap it up here with all the entries. You have got Q, you have got Q+, plus, you have got J, you have got K, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, 0x, 1x, x1, x0. That's your excitation table. Questions about how to derive excitation table of a JK flip-flop and by extension, hopefully you guys are starting to think about, all right, if you, if you had to uh, derive the uh, excitation table of some other flip-flop, how would it look like?
Okay. Now let's do the problem, right? So let's try to take a look at uh, how we achieved this, right? You are given the D flip flop and you are asked to make a JK flip flop using a D flip flop. How do you do that? There, there is a step by step process to do this conversion from one flip flop to the other. Because what we had was D, what we desired was a JK. So we converted a D flip flop into a JK flip flop. And that step, it, it involves three steps actually. The first step is to write the next state table or the characteristic table of the desired flip-flop. What do you desire? You want to make a JK flip-flop. So you try to write the next state table or the characteristic table of the JK flip-flop first. So what should I do here? Uh, I suppose it's going to be pretty straightforward, right? Let's, let's run through this. Uh, zero one zero one zero one zero one two zeros two ones two zeros two ones and four zeros and four ones all right what is q plus going to be for the first two my jk flip-flop is in what configuration what state for the first two entries For the first two entries, what am I doing? Store. That's right. So what should be Q plus? Q plus should equal Q. That's right. Zero and one. For the next two, what state am I in? The JK flip-flop is in the kill state. That's right. So Q plus should be what? Zero. Independent of Q. Zero. That's right. And for the next two, I am going to be in the uh, what state? Jump state. And over here, Q plus should equal one. And the last one is what? Uh, what? What was the last one? Toggle. So Q plus should be what? One zero. Exactly the opposite of Q. That's right. So you're done with step one. We have written the next state table of the desired flip-flop. This is what we want. This is what we desire. The second step is to write the excitation table of the given flip-flop. What are we given? We are given a D flip-flop, a data flip-flop. So we are going to try to write the excitation table of the D flip-flop, which is here. Uh, how many uh, entries should I put here in terms of Q and Q plus? How many rows am I going to have in this excitation table? How many rows? Four of them. That's right. Now, if question is, what should I do for D here? It's a data flip-flop. If you wanted to go from a zero to a zero, what should you give here? Zero to a one, what should you give here? One to a zero, what should you give here? One to one, what should you give here? It's a data flip-flop. Whatever goes in will come out as your next state. It happens after your active edge of the clock but whatever goes in comes out so you know in other words q plus equals d or d flip-flop the next state is whatever you give me at the input d 
So literally what I can do is copy this guy and paste it here. You guys see that? If you want a zero as your next state output, you have to give the excitation of D as zero and one and zero and one. You guys see that? All right. Let us try to talk about the third step here. Third step is sort of putting the first step and the second step together. So what I'm going to do is go all the way back and grab the first state table. That's what we desire. And I'm going to get rid of all these yellow things here. Now I'm going to say, if I'm going to make an additional column here, if you want the transition from Q to Q plus, what kind of input do you give at D? This is what you desire. This is what you have. So if you wanted Q to Q plus, that transition to happen, what should you give at the D input? So what do you guys think D should be? If you wanted, uh, another way of looking at it is, this was kind of our first, uh, first step, right? This was our first step. Step one. And this is going to be sort of our second step. That's right, Q plus. All you have to do is copy this guy and paste it right here and you're done. Now with this, we can actually derive a relationship between D, J, K, Q. So that is going to require us to make a K map. Let's try to draw a K map here. The inputs to the K map are J, K and Q. The outputs of the K map are the equation for D. J, K, and Q, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, this 0, this is 1. And you're writing it for your D. Uh, the, you're trying to find out a, a simplest SOP for D. So what are you going to have to do? Well, you are going to have to take this guy, this column, and transition that into a K-map. Let's try to do that. Uh, you've got 0, 1, 0, 0. Then you've got 1, 1, 1, 0. You guys agree with the entry in the K-map? Next, you try to combine simplest SOP that forms a group and this guy forms a group which essentially means D is J Q complement or A complement and Q I can also box this result up a q complement plus k complement q that's right that's absolutely right and let's try to just go back here and take a look at does it make sense
what is the logic expression over here j and qn what is the logic expression over here a complement and q what is the logic expression over here d equals j q complement or k complement and q that's right so you have taken a d flip-flop so essentially you found an equation <laughs> you found an equation that lets you determine what should you connect to the input of the d flip-flop so that the overall design becomes a jk flip-flop you guys see that all right how much time do we have oh we have 20 minutes that's like three years uh so let's continue a t latch a toggle latch so this will be sort of our last uh flip-flop configuration or a latch configuration we had sr d uh, jk and our last one in terms of a standard latch or a flip-flop is the toggle latch or flip-flop which is very useful in designing counters we are going to you know talk about designing counters uh, 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 a few weeks from now but that that's going to be very useful toggle t latch so t latch versus t flip-flop what is the difference exactly the same difference as a latch versus a flip-flop one is level sensitive the other is edge sensitive but their behavior their characteristic is going to be the same you are either toggling or you are not toggling so if your t input or your toggle input is a zero then do not toggle meaning q plus equals q don't change it don't toggle and when t input is one please do toggle to Whatever you wear, flip it. You complement. This is toggle. And you, you can you can take this in kind of you know go to uh, 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 the the all four combinations because Q itself uh, could be a zero or be a one, right? So we can we can say all right, you can have zero zero or you can have zero, one, you can have one zero or you can have one. Five. Um. So for the first two, you are not toggling, which means Q plus equals Q. And for the last two, you are toggling T is one. So that means zero becomes a one and one, be one becomes a zero. And this actually gives you an, uh, the characteristic equation of a T. Characteristic equation. Of T e latch or flip flop. What is that? Uh, can you guys tell me the, the relationship between T, Q, and Q plus? What is the logic expression? That's right, Q plus equals T exclusive or Q. That's uh, exclusive or, right? It's it's the inequality detector, right? So that would be uh, Q plus equals T exclusive or Q. That's your characteristic equation of a T latch or a flip flop. What would be the excitation table of a T flip flop? Old output zero, new output zero. What should I give at T? Zero, one, one, zero. All right. So don't toggle. Please toggle. Please toggle. Don't toggle. Right. So that's your excitation table of your T flip flop. Now let's do another uh, example here. Design a toggle flip-flop using a data flip-flop. 
So what we have is a D flip-flop, a data flip-flop. What you want is to design a toggle flip-flop. What do you start with? Step number one is to write the next state table of the desired flip-flop. We desire a T over here, toggle. So we are going to start off with step number one, which is a characteristic table of toggle flip-flop. So you have entries that are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, right? So in the first two cases, you do not toggle because t is 0. So you have 0 and 1. For the next two cases, you are toggling. So one becomes a, uh, 0 becomes a 1, 1 becomes a 0. Now using the character, using this, you can try to figure out what trans, what should I give at the D input to get this transition to happen? So you look back at the characteristic equation for a data flip-flop, which is Q plus equals D. In other words, D equals Q plus. 0, 1, 1, 0. That's right. And now you have to write, in, in this case, you don't even need a um, K map. You can just write an equation for D in terms of T and Q. What would that be? The equation here for D in terms of T and Q. Exclusive or, that's right. So that would be D equals T exclusive or uh, Q. You guys see that? Uh, let me just a page here. What did we have? We had a D flip flop, right? So just let me just draw a D flip flop here. One, two, three, four. I've got a D flip flop. Uh, let's make it a positive edge trigger D flip flop. Uh, I've got a D input here, a clock input here. Oi. What is wrong with you? Um, and then. It, you know, I have a T input coming in. Uh, this is my Q. This is also my Q. But there is a bubble in front of this guy. All right. And this is, of course, my data. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the, the equation was what? I have the positive edge trigger D flip-flop. I wanted to make a T flip-flop and the equation that I have is D equals T exclusive or Q. Exclusive or gate, one of the inputs is T, one of the inputs is Q. Alright, so let's just draw that here. Exclusive or gate, let us see if it draws. Okay. One of the inputs is T. Uh, maybe. And the other input is Q. Put a dot in here. This is just it. One, two, three, four. And the last piece, this input actually drives this guy. Can I see that? So you have a clock input here. So that would be your toggle flip-flop, a positive edge trigger toggle flip-flop designed using a positive edge triggered data flip-flop. Um, what if you wanted to design a negative edge trigger? What if you wanted negative edge triggered uh, T flip flop invert the clock that's right all you need to do is put a not gate over here and that is it this would be 
How do you design a negative edge trigger toggle flip flop using a positive edge trigger D flip flop? That would be the solution for that. All right, questions, you guys. I miss my Minecraft D flip flops. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, we have, hold up, give me one sec. All right, uh, what I'll do is, I'm gonna stop here, I'm gonna stop recording here.